Yaga Africa, a civil society organization, said it had concluded plans to deploy 500 election observers to 250 polling units in the upcoming governorship election in Edo. The executive director of the organization, Samson Itodo, said during a virtual meeting held with journalists in Benin that 24 long-term observers and 18 coalition observers would also be deployed for the election. Itodo said the organization would be using the Watch the Vote plan for the elections as citizens vote amidst COVID-19. Watch the Vote, according to him, is a movement of citizens committed to credible elections using credible data to counter misinformation while also improving the quality of election reporting. We now have Samson Itodo, the executive director, Yaga Africa, joining us from Abuja. Good morning, Mr. Itodo. Well, good morning and thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us on News on the R. Now, what are your major concerns as you prepare to monitor the Edo governorship election? Well, thanks. And there are several concerns um, that we have at Yaga Africa uh, and as citizens of this country. Um, the first is this is an election that will be conducted against the background of COVID-19. So we are conducting elections amidst the COVID-19, and INEC has issued guidelines um, as well as its policy to regulate elections within this context. We are concerned with some provisions in the, in the policy um, as it relates to um, some provisions on election day voting and activity. One of the provisions in the policy um, states that for voters or any, any voter um, exhibits or shows any signs of COVID-19, such a person shall be isolated and the protocol um, will be enforced. And we know that the standard protocol will be isolation. And so what happens to the voting rights of that particular individual is very, very unclear. So that's a huge source of concern. Um, of course, face mask, no voting. That's what the guidelines um, say. But INEC has amended that to say any covering. Our expectation is that people will not, uh, politicians and will not exploit that um, policy to um, disenfranchise people from casting their votes because the elections provide an opportunity for voters to cast their votes. The other issue is the pre-election violence that we saw arising from either the intrapatry inter conflict um, that has been in existence for quite some time. And we're very, very concerned that um, if the security agencies do not rise to the situation, um, we may have violent elections. And we don't hope for that. Um, our other concern is about voter turnout. Historically, both Edo and Ondo have had very, very poor turnout for elections. In these two states, over the last um, 10 to 12 years, none of them have recorded up to 40% voter turnout. If you're conducting elections within a pandemic, um, and, and this is coming against the background of poor voter turnout, we expect that the turnout will be very, very low. There are three fundamental issues that INEC needs to deal with with these elections. Um, first for us is the enforceability of the policy and the guidelines that it's issued. Um, the campaigns are going to start in a few days. By 29th of, of this month, um, all the parties would have submitted their list of candidates, and then campaigns will, will commence. We hope that just as the parties have upheld you know, the social distancing guidelines for the conduct of their primaries, they will do the same for, um, for the for their campaigns, so we don't they don't jeopardize, you know, the health of um, of people um, and, and voters in these two states. Mm -hmm. The other issue is the dilemma between electoral in, safeguarding electoral integrity as well as public safety. This is where we're going to have a very big challenge um, because we cannot undermine the electoral process just because we want to protect health. We can also not undermine public health because we want to ensure um, electoral integrity. So where do these you are put critical the balance? issues. So whether INEC is going to enforce this or the political parties will comply with this, we'll keep our fingers crossed and watch.
Right. I was asking you on the uh, just what you said about uh, not putting health, uh, the health of the people at risk, and of course also not disenfranchising uh, the people. Now, where, how do you strike the balance? Would you rather say that if someone is suspected to have COVID and uh, maybe presenting strong um, symptoms? Should such person actually come to vote? Would, what would be the right thing to do, even though he or she has got the right to vote? Let, let, let me make this clear, that the Constitution is very, very clear, and the Electoral Act is clear for the conditions of voting, as well as the criteria for voting. It's very, very clear that first, you must be a citizen of this country. You must have attained the age of 18. You must um, be a registered voter. And you must also have your PVC to be able to cast your vote. That, these are the current provisions um, for qualifying um, to vote at elections. The Constitution clearly says that you cannot discriminate, you cannot disenfranchise someone on the basis of their religion, on the basis of their sex, or on the basis of their ethnic um, extraction. And so, yes, we're dealing with a pandemic, a uh, very, very... This, um, devastating and deadly virus. But that does not mean these people don't have rights. We can't surrender the rights of, of, of people or prevent them from voting because of the health challenge that they have. Yes, it may be pandemic or we may be in a pandemic situation, but it's a health challenge and we can't, you know, um, discriminate or disenfranchise them. So the state and INEC needs to ensure that there are provisions that safeguards the voting rights of these people. And that is why civil society, particularly Yaga Africa, has said, INEC needs to be very, very clear on what happens on election day if someone shows symptoms of, um, of COVID-19. Those people should be, they can still cast their vote, but they can do so under special um, conditions. Right. Um, and that is why we encourage you know, voters to use face masks um, to also use hand um, hand sanitizers, um, but I, I don't think that if we if they if there is lack of clarity no. on managing that circumstance, that can be exploited um, to prevent people from casting their vote. All a politician needs to do is to compromise officials in strongholds of his um, of of the opposition, and then use that to disrupt the process. Yeah and it dilutes the votes that might come from the strongholds of this opposition. And so that level playing field needs to be created. But again, it boils down to the individuals and the actors okay. in this election. All right, so the Samson, let's, Mr. Itodo, we we'll, would have today. to move away from that now. Uh, sorry, I have to interject. You've made that clarification. Let, let's move on to other matters. Uh, considering all that is playing out, how confident now are you that parties will be able to resolve their internal wranglings in time before the elections? Well, if the parties don't resolve their wranglings in time, you've got judicial review. That is why the courts um, is also stepping in um, uh, because we're a constitutional democracy and that's why the courts do exist. Um, the courts can act as arbiter. But we cannot subject, and, I, and I, I want to make the point that it's not all the time that um, legal technicalities can guarantee justice or electoral integrity. We've been very, very disturbed and concerned with the kind of judgments um, conflicting judgments that have come from the judiciary. So as much as possible, the political parties need to exhaust, you know, internal mechanisms of resolving their dispute. The sad part is you do not have political parties that are democratic in every respect. And so it is just simply a contest between the godfathers and the party, or it's just simply elites um, trying to settle scores within themselves. So it's not about the people. And, and all the parties are the same. As you can see how they've been jumping ship from one party to another, or one platform to another, and, and just to actualize their political ambition. I, I think the parties have a critical role to play. I am confident um, that if INEC is truly transparent and exercises its power as a regulatory agency, if the people of Edo and Ondo state recognize that these politicians and political parties do not exist 
to serve the interests of the people, but just to procure power, to use them to serve their own ends or settle elite conflict, then they will participate actively in the process. And for me is, how do we raise the bar that any candidate presented by a political party, citizens are asking them fundamental questions about their agenda and what people call issue-based politics and how are they going to deliver and what sort of set of timelines. It should be about individuals who have character, who have competence, who have capacity to hold the office. Mm. It shouldn't be about whether the person comes from your ethnic or religious, um, religious group. So the people have a role to play. And then the institutions, like security agencies, they also have a role to play. The memories of Kogi and Bayelsa are still fresh in our minds, um, where we were told that fake policemen or fake security agencies overpowered um, our security agencies and cost mayhem in these elections. Mm-hmm. I, we hope that as we march towards Edo and Ondo, that we will not have a repeat of this. Um, and these security agencies will be very professional and very transparent in their management of election security mm-hmm. um, for these two elections. But above all, the people of Edo and Ondo have a huge responsibility to be vigilant to ask the right questions, but turn out to vote. If you don't come out to vote, be rest assured, it's either someone is voting for you or your vote, you've lost the opportunity to actually make a difference in these two elections. And it will be a very sad and disappointing situation if that happens.